the masters. You don't have to show me who you are. I can tell by the smell. My nose isn't that big. I want to see. If you love listening to this show, please consider giving a rating and a review on Amazon Alexa or wherever you listen. We want to continue bringing you this amazing content, and part of our ability to do that means that we need a big audience. Now, it may not seem like much, but rating and reviewing the show will help more people find us, just like how you found this show. Simply on any podcast platform, search for a show, scroll down to the bottom, and push five stars. It's that easy. Thanks for supporting the show. Today, I'm joined by Gary Gilliam, who is a former NFL offensive tackle with the Seattle Seahawks and San Francisco 49ers. Thanks for joining today. Thanks for having me. All right. So, Gary, you've spent three seasons with the Seattle Seahawks and two seasons with the San Francisco 49ers. Um, you know, when you kind of look back at your career, what are some of the key highlights that come to your mind uh, when you, you know, think about your career there? Well, definitely my rookie year going to the Super Bowl was, was a highlight. Um, the game before that, the NFC Championship game, was a highlight as well. Um, I actually caught a touchdown in that game on a fake field goal that I think I'm most known for in the Seattle area. Um, so definitely those two moments. Looking back, you know, you don't come across Super Bowls often. And also as an offensive tackle, you don't come across touchdowns often. So certainly both of those. Absolutely. Well, you, you're definitely a hero in Seattle, I'm sure, uh, without a doubt. Now, um, you're working on a pretty interesting project, and that's part of the reason we've invited you to this show. Is uh, it's called the Bridge, right? Um, and it's interesting because it seems like you guys are converting abandoned buildings in the inner city of Harrisburg, and then transforming them into eco villages. Can, can you elaborate? Yeah. So Harrisburg is actually just our pilot location. That's where myself and a lot of the other founders are from. Um, but we are actually in the process of replicating that model in other cities. Uh, but, but yeah, essentially what it is, is, you know, we're a for purpose real estate development company and we're targeting some of these old properties like schools, malls and warehouses, and we're converting them into eco villages, which is essentially a fancy way to say a mixed use development that has everything that you do in a day in kind of one place. Um, we call it the WELP impact model, work, eat, live, learn, play. Um, so within that work branch, that's co-working spaces maker spaces, you know, areas for entrepreneurs to come for incubation, acceleration. That eat branch is really trying to combat and transform food deserts into food oases by growing food hydroponically and aeroponically. Um, and also teaching people how to grow food that uh, live is housing, right? Affordable housing and luxury housing. It's important for both to be together. Um, so that's the live branch. Learn is actually the developmental and educational programming that kind of aids all the other branches. So learn to work is teaching the entrepreneurs how to put their businesses together, learn to eat, teaching people how to farm and the importance of nutrition and a plant based diet. Learn to live is actually teaching people how to invest in real estate to create generational wealth. Um, The learn branch itself is a heavy lean into financial wellness, teaching people how to repair their credit get their taxes done, how to leverage multiple streams of income to invest in different ways. Um, So that's the learn branch. Also job training, heavy lean into industrial trades, as well as, you know, things like carpentry, um, plumbing, right, to be the ones that can build up your community. And then that play branch itself is actually, um, you know, sports complex, virtual reality areas, um, spaces for TED Talks, concerts, what have you. And then the link there between the learn to play connection is that correlation between mental health and physical health that in, in a lot of these communities that we're targeting, those communities have, you know, PTSD or they're pretty bad neighborhoods. So, you know, you got to kind of unwind that. Um, so we're offering services to allow people to, you know, go through therapy, have healthy outlets and what have you. Um, so essentially a one-stop shop to create what we call systemic empowerment. Um, you know, our worthy adversary or kind of who we're fighting against is systemic oppression. Um, and instead of, you know, trying to make it kind of trying to segment it out and, and attack one part of it at a time, it's a strategically put together and holistic issue 
and it needs as just strategically put together and holistic of a solution. Uh, and we, we believe that the bridge and real estate development is a, is a great way to really start to combat systemic oppression. Well, it's a, it's interesting because I, as I'm listening, you know, I think, um, you know, well, first of all, just to kind of bring some parallelism is that those that actually make it into the NFL and then actually have a, a you know, thriving career, it's a very small percentage and it, it's talk about hardship and overcoming difficulties. I mean, you know, the real estate is hard enough. And this notion of one-stop shop that has all these facets of services, amenities, and of course, uh, you know, benefit to the to local community. I mean, that th these are pretty massive goals that you have. And again, just, just like going getting into the NFL is just that difficult. Uh, and it's very, in many ways, it's ambitious and audacious as, as well. Um, can you talk about maybe a little bit around kind of why you felt that this was such a calling for you specifically post uh, NFL career? Yeah, a lot of lived experience. You know, I'm, I'm from Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, which is kind of the epitome of systemic oppression, food deserts, redlining. The school district is ranked very low in the state. You know, obesity levels, just a lot of things that I that I saw and grew up in until my mom actually put me in a boarding school. Um, about 15 minutes away from Harrisburg called Milton Hershey School. And that school showed me that the only difference really for me and the, how my family was was being raised or had always been raised was the environment. And it was, that's what really made all the difference. And it always makes me think of a quote, talent is evenly distributed, but resources and opportunity are not. So I had saw, you know, kind of the trajectory of my life before I went to that school and then the resources, the opportunity, the environment that I got, and then where my life went after that um, showed me really a solution to a lot of the problems that 2020 really highlighted and some things that a lot of our team, like I said, have already lived through in their life. So had some solutions for those things. Um, so kind of in, in reference to, to the kind of the audacious aspects of it, it's really a lot of the solutions that we provide are already out there. Right. But, you know, if you're a single mom with two kids and you're trying to get your credit repaired so that you can invest in a property or maybe, you know, take some night classes or something. Yeah, you can find all those things, but they're all around the city. You got to take three buses here, do this, do that. The kids running this way. Right. So here's a space. Come, you can put your kids in a little daycare area. They'll be getting some good educational programming and you do what you got to do, whether it's repair your credit, learn how to invest in the stock market, go down to the makerspace, create a, you know, uh, a product, take it over to the digital media lab, you know, take some pictures, connect with an SEO expert, push that out there, right? Just now you can do it all in one space and you could technically also live there too. So now you don't have to take a bus to all these different places. You can now put boots on and pick yourself up by bootstraps, right? We're trying to provide boots to the old quote that we hear oftentimes, right? So, so, you're, so you're talking about something that is so entrenched, uh, spe specifically in the US in terms of you know the, the, the history of, of uh, racist, uh, racism in terms of institution, right? And this um, inequality of resources is so prevalent. And I think uh, Harrisburg is just one example of many other cities that uh, have also similar, very much similar institutionalized issues. Um, in terms of the resources that you're looking to bring through the bridge, I mean, this is pretty profound. I mean, just, just to be very clear is, you know, a lot of these uh, inner cities, it's hard enough to get decent public school, let alone, you know, places where they can have reliable internet aside from their phone. Now you're actually bringing like um, uh, almost like startup quality types of capabilities, whether it's 3D printing, as well as um, new ways of uh, learning, uh, new education, new programming, things that's not, you know, easily found and re readily available. Uh, again, that's a resource that it doesn't exist. Um, so that, that's, that in itself is a huge value. Uh, why try to tackle it from the private sector? Why not also try to you know, tackle it more from a combination of public-private? Oh, it is. It is a public-private partnership. Um, you know, obviously pursuing grants within some of our sustainability things that we're doing. Um, a lot of funds have been put together you know, kind of corporate social responsibility, social equity type funds have been put together. So, you know, we're pursuing those on the private side, you know, we'll include unaccredited investors with actually a, a real estate crowd fund that will open up at some point to allow unaccredited investors to invest right alongside our accredited investors, right? 
most specifically the athletes and entertainers that are from these different areas that need these bridges. Um, so, you know, there'll be ambassadors that bring the model into their neighborhood and replicate that blueprint to, to help their communities as well. Um, so it is a combination of public and private funds. Um, and that's kind of what it takes. You know, the space is, is kind of common ground for a bunch of different sectors. So those same sectors should be involved with, you know, bettering and restoring our communities. Yeah. And, and it's, it's interesting, uh, again, because, you know, when we look at uh, case studies like, let's say, Detroit, for example, um, it's so hard for them to attract outside capital. Um, and in some ways, um, really, the solution has to be organically homegrown. And I think that's really what we're talking about is this, you know, instead of looking to outside the community, you, you're looking within the community and allowing for that leadership to emerge organically. Uh, so that's, that's quite interesting. Um, and as it ties to climate change, you know, when we think about, uh, you know, buildings or structures that are abandoned in particularly, it actually does have a huge carbon footprint. Uh, you know, there could be gas leaks, uh, there could be other things that's you know, consuming electricity, uh, but they're eff effectively almost like brownfields. So if you, you know, I've been throughout the, throughout the world where I've seen first industrial revolution, uh, industrial cities that now have become just an eyesore, and these are brownfields, and they still continue to emit carbon. How is revitalizing some of these inner cities into newer forms, like, like the bridge, helping to reduce the impact of the environment and make the city more beautiful? and just more livable. Yeah, well, a lot of these buildings before a certain time were really built to last. Like, you know, they're fallout shelters, bomb shelters, they got really good bones. But like, you know, their, their systems, like their digestive system, if you will, or their, ner their nervous system, right? The HVAC and, and some of those things are not updated, solar panels, water collection, some of the technologies that have come along since those buildings have been built I feel like it's really up to us to convert the ones that can be used, right? Not all of them can be used. So, you know, you find the ones that can and convert them and, and, and pour the money in from public and private sectors. Because in most cases, these beautiful buildings are schools that are smack dab in the middle of these residential areas where a lot of that community needs the help that we're trying to provide. So you need to put together a plan, figure out a way to convert these old buildings, which is the most sustainable thing you can do when it can be done update the system so that now sustainability really means longevity, right? Now that building and its community that it thrives, it, it, it is sustaining itself. Um, and you need to, to update buildings in order for them to do that, right? Solar panels, water collection, geothermal, converting food waste, if you will, into energy and nutrients to, to close the loop for your food systems, right? There's a lot of things that, that can be done and that are being done but definitely not being done in black communities, especially not underserved communities across America. So there's a lot of opportunities and a lot of developers aren't targeting the properties that we're looking to target and or the school districts, land banks, municipalities that own these properties don't just want your traditional development built there, right? Whether it be affordable housing, a nursing home, nothing wrong with those things, but they understand from a city comprehensive plan standpoint that you need to put something very significant there as the school was very significant to that community. Mm -hmm. right? um, and again, just kind of an inspiration from the school that I went to, Milton Hershey School, it wasn't just a school that was built that way, but Milton Hershey himself founded the town of Hershey that way. He created the town for his chocolate factory workers and spaces for them to work, eat, live, learn, and play, right? Hershey Park, Hershey Gardens, Milton Hershey School, Hershey Theater, right? He created the town so his workers had everything that they needed right there. And then the school was a microcosm of that, right? So from seeing those environments and seeing kind of the Pleasantville type environment that Hershey was only 15 minutes away from then the epitome of systemic oppression of Harrisburg, mm. we can recreate different environments, right? Not the perfect environment in Hershey, obviously, but like you can take some models from it and be inspired and kind of build a bridge, you know, off of Milton Hershey's shoulders. Yeah, that makes so much sense. I think I think when you phrase it that way, it, it just uh, it, it makes a beautiful, beautiful uh, narrative uh, story that really resonates with a lot of people. Um, and the other thing that I picked up, which I think is interesting, is when we think about you know development companies, they tend to think in terms of you know demolish and rebuild. And one of the things that you mentioned is that you guys are looking to leverage the kind of the infrastructure that's already there. I mean, these buildings, like I said, were built to last, but coming in and retrofitting it so that it's, it's you know, up to code, including, you know, sustainability, 
and um, solar and energy and, and conservation and so forth uh, is really taking an existing asset and, and enhancing that asset versus let's say you're trying to demolish it and start from new, correct? Right, exactly. Um, now, one thing that I think uh, people are probably thinking and asking is going to be, you know, the, the model that you just explained in terms of the original founder, uh, founder, um, you know, the Hershey family and what he was trying to create from uh, this kind of, you know, hub for the community makes a ton of sense. At the same time, some listeners are thinking, gosh, by retrofitting these older buildings, are you potentially, you know, adding to gentrification um, or is it is it going to potentially inflate the, the the cost or the pricing of real estate or tenancy for some of these people that are already struggling to make ends meet? That makes a lot of sense, which is why the community is heavily involved with the planning, which is why affordable, big A affordable and little A affordable, meaning just attainable housing, is a major part of the, the housing aspect of the bridge so that it is accessible for those who need it. Part of that real estate crowdfunding um, fund that I spoke about is not just to allow the local community to invest into the bridge, but part of that fund is to start to then acquire and renovate residential properties around the bridge and also educate those individuals so that they can be the homeowners in those places to increase the homeowner occupied rate, which increases the property value, increasing funding to our school district, which increases our workforce, making it more attractive in a few years for more and bigger and better corporations to come into it, right? So there's a process to spur economic development um, and we're including everyone, you know, like it's, it's not like only the luxury or only the affluent or whatever the case may be will be here. It's actually geared to attract the other side, right? The people who actually need these resources. And in most cases, these buildings and these schools are in neighborhoods that really, really need it, right? So us as developers, first of all, being a minority developer, in and of itself is something that's a lot different when it comes to quote unquote gentrification. Gentrification isn't bad. It's bad when it's not done by the community for the community to then build up the community. Um, so we're very, very involved with the community to make sure that that type of thing does not happen. And even just within our business model and who our demographic is with who we want to be at the bridge for the most part um, prevents that from happening as well. You know, I think a couple of years ago, I remember having some conversation with uh, some colleagues in New York City, and it was around this notion of tokenization of ownership, um, where, you know, in a kind of a, let's say a feudal system, you have landlords and you have tenants. And the, as long as that model exists, tenants are always going to be at the mercy of the landlords. And this notion that, um, you know, decentralization and different types of forms of ownership is allowing for, let's say, the tenant types of models to actually have ownership opportunities. So when you talk about this crowdfunding, it has you know, a couple of things that brings up. One is this inclusion of ownership that previously they were excluded from. I mean, you know, in these communities who actually technically own property, you know, besides maybe their primary home, for instance. So being able to actually participate in an upside capital appreciation asset like real estate, uh, that's very interesting. The other downside of it, however, is that, you know, because it's non-accredited, it also means that you're tapping into people that are not as sophisticated. And that percentage that they're investing into that crowdsource proportionally is much bigger for them relative to their discretionary income or household income. So how do you balance kind of the risk relative to the value of ownership that's uh, adding to their overall wealth? Yeah, it's an opportunity to educate the community on real estate investing. And in a lot of cases, right, so within our learn branch, we're looking to show people how they can make other streams of income and then invest that income into other assets that produce more cash flow. Um, and we that's a major part of it before, you know, we would never want to take someone's last five hundred dollars to invest in our crowdfund. Right. And then kind of the other side of it, you know, working with the unaccredited investors when it comes to commercial real estate development. They may think that with an investment of $500, you'd get like $10,000 back. But like the way we explain it is like, look, if you put $500 in and seven years, it'd be worth this amount of money. Right. So people know what, what the case is, what the quote unquote dividend would be, which, again, is an opportunity to educate that that group and that community on what it really means to invest. Um, like I said, alongside the programming of financial wellness. Right. We're trying to rebrand financial literacy as financial wellness. Um so teaching people all that stuff before and while they invest. Um, 
I think that's that's really the best thing that we can do is provide the education. And in most cases, doing it is the best way to learn. Hmm. Very interesting. Very interesting. Well, I, I certainly hope that uh, from a from a vision perspective that, you know, a a city uh, that could be owned by its actual uh, tenants and, um, you know, those that actually live and work there is it's a it's a marvelous thing. And I think um, that's the way it was really intended to be. So um, very, very exciting. Um, now, can you talk about, practically speaking, where are you in terms of the de development uh, plan? Uh, and where you mentioned that um, the current location is just the initial site. Uh, what's kind of the bigger scale plan as well? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So we'll be starting construction for that pilot site in the summer of this year. And we're planning on being able to finish up that eco village by the fourth quarter of 2022. Uh, we may add some a couple more aspects to our campus. We're working with a few other partners to see what might end up there, but that'd be an, an, another phase. So there may be some other phases added on to it. Um, that's kind of the situation there. We'll be actually starting up uh, that crowdfunding platform or excuse me, that campaign sometime in March. Um, there's some new legislation that came out that actually increased the amount of money you can raise from those un unaccredited investors. Um, so we wanted to wait till after that timeline to start that side of it. So they have an opportunity to get involved um, in March. So be on the lookout for that. But in terms of, of scaling up and replicating our bridge model, within the next six years, we plan on having eight bridge locations which sounds very ambitious, but we're actually already in the process of working with developers, scouting sites and getting together the capital to be able to transform those buildings as well. All right, very, very exciting. Um, and, and just to kind of tie it all together is that um, going back to your NFL career is that, you know, you've have accomplished things that that's just unheard of really. Um, just not, it's not even unusual, it's just unheard of. It's a true outlier in many ways. But it's taken a ton of grit, perseverance, and hard work, and determination. And I think the journey that's in front of you is going to require exactly the same thing as well. So with that, I've been joined by Gary Gilliam, a former NFL offensive tackle, and now leading the effort at The Bridge. If you've enjoyed this episode, take a moment to rate our show on any podcast platform that you listen to. Scroll down to the bottom and push five stars. It's that easy. And as always, thanks for listening.